Hello, I'm Mike Parker Pearson. I'm a professor of archaeology at University College London. I'm also a fellow of the British Academy, and I've been researching Stonehenge for the last 20 years. And in the last nine years, we've had a really exciting investigation of the origins of Stonehenge. Where did it come from? And to look for the answers to that, we need to think about its stones. Now it's 5,000 years old, built across the transition from the Stone Age to the Bronze Age. Uh, the Stone Age at this time is what we call the Neolithic, the time of farming, and it was around 3000 BC that the first stage of it was built, the first of five stages in all. The second stage was when the great Sarsens went up. So if you go to Stonehenge, those are the ones that you see. They're the ones that have the lintels on top of them. And these are stage two around 2500 BC. We've just found out where they came from and it's 15 miles away. So that's quite a long way to bring, bring some really big rocks. And uh, we think that they're from a place called West Woods, not far from the Great Circle at Avebury. But it's the first stage of Stonehenge that really intrigues me because we now think that the stones that were put up then were not the Sarsons, but stones that we call blue stones, stones that have an, an unusual origin a long way away. They're arranged in Stonehenge today. You can go and see them, uh, especially if you get access to go inside the monument. And although they're called blue stones, they're actually a whole series of different kinds of rocks. There's dolerites uh, and rhyolites. These are types of volcanic rock and the dolerites are divided between plain ones and spotted. So some of them have little white spots in the rock. And we've been working with geologists who've actually been able to find out precisely where some of these different types came from. And it's a very long way away. It's the Priscelli Hills of West Wales, 140 miles as the crow flies, but in any direction, in any route you take, it's probably going to take at least 180 miles. So that's what, 240 kilometers or so. Now, of course, they're not particularly big, but they're still weigh up to three or slightly more tons, um, whereas that's the weight at which the sarsens start. But it's a lot further to move them. Our geologists have pinpointed some of the sources. Here's one of them. This is Craig Rosavellin. And you can see that the outcrop has naturally formed pillars. You've really just got to prise them off, a kind of Neolithic Ikea. And where that red arrow is, is where the geologists were able to match one of the types of rock at Stonehenge. So we know exactly where on this rock outcrop that pillar came from. And through our excavations, we can date it to around 3400 BC. This is another quarry that our geologists identified. It's Khan Goidog, uh, halfway up the mountain of the Priscelles. And here we have uh, the, uh, the remains of quarrying, where again, the pillars were ready formed. They just had to lever them off and then drag them away. What we've also found is that the area of the Priscelli Hills wasn't some kind of backwater in the Neolithic. It was a veritable ceremonial centre. Not only were there Neolithic monumental tombs, dolmens, like the one at Pentarivan, but there were also Neolithic enclosures. And where the quarries were close to was the remains of a former stone circle. It's called Wine Mound. You can see it in the centre of this plan here. And when we visited the site, there were just four stones in an arc. And we wondered whether maybe this had once been a Neolithic stone circle, most of its stones being transported to Salisbury Plain to form the first stage of Stonehenge. So we began our excavations here. And we discovered that as well as the four stones, they're marked on this plan as little black and red dots. There are a whole series of other features marked in blue. And some of them turned out to be the holes for standing stones that have been taken away 
in prehistory. In the photograph there, you can see one of them, that uh, the, you can see the packing stones left in place, but the imprint, that square imprint next to them, is where the pillar had originally stood and then been pulled out. Here's another one, an even larger stone uh, during excavation. And what we discovered was this was no ordinary stone circle. This was the largest in Wales, in fact, the third largest in the whole of Britain, 110 metres in diameter. It also had an entrance pointing towards midsummer sunrise. And we were able to date it using radiocarbon and thermoluminescence dating methods. The date somewhere around 3400 BC. What was more amazing was that when we looked at it and compared its plan to that of Stonehenge, we realized that they had exactly the same diameter. Stonehenge's ditch, 110 meters. Wine Mound Stone Circle, 110 meters. So it looks as though the people that put up Stonehenge had actually even remembered the measurements when they moved all those stones. Now, of course, one of the big questions is how did they do it? Archaeologists have generally thought that they took them by sea, but it's quite a tricky thing to load a three ton pillar into a kind of log boat or a skin boat or whatever. And I think it's far more likely that they brought them over land as far as possible. They would have had to cross water at some point uh, across the Severn estuary or further up, uh, 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 perhaps north of Gloucester somewhere. But uh, that makes a lot more sense, I think, because not just the quarries, but the stone circle itself, they're on the north side of the Priscelli Hills. So you'd have to drag them over a mountain before you even started your journey. The second fascinating question is, why did they do it? And we're not entirely sure, but I think one of the fascinating possibilities is that people may have actually abandoned their homelands at that time and moved eastwards. Because we've discovered there's, there's something of a gap in the archaeological record after 3000 BC for the next 2000 years. There's no evidence to speak of of any human habitation or presence in the Priscelli region of North Pembrokeshire. If that's the case, and more research will be needed, it's another possibility that there's a second political reason for doing this. Might this have been an act of unification to bring two different tribal groups within Britain together? So not only were they moving what must have been their ancestral symbols of identity, but also merging together different communities in a shared origin and a shared purpose. All of this, of course, is uh, speculation for future study. And that's something I'm going to be looking at in the years to come. I hope you've enjoyed this. Thank you very much for listening.